Hello? Ah, it works. Awesome. I feel like Elvis. This is great. Um, all right. So first things first, your portable personal surveillance devices. Uh, turn them to off or to mute. Um, I'm going to turn mine off. It's a blessed moment when I do. Um, all right. Everybody, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm Dan Rockmore, director of the Newcomb Institute for Computational Science here at Dartmouth College. And on behalf of the college and the Newcomb Institute, I'd like to welcome you all to this year's fall Donahoe Colloquium, discovering the past through deep ocean exploration from Dr. Jim Delgado, PhD, senior vice president of SEARCH, a company that is at the leading edge of cultural heritage discovery and preservation. The Donahoe Colloquium is an ongoing series of public lectures aimed at increasing awareness of the many important and sometimes surprising places in which computational ideas are shaping our lives. These events are made possible by a generous gift from David, Mickey, and Dan Donahoe in honor of Dan's graduation as a member of the class of 2006. It's a central piece of the larger mission of the Newcomb Institute whose aim is to support and to integrate computational thinking and computational ideas throughout the Dartmouth community. The Institute itself is made possible through the generosity of Bill Newcomb, Dartmouth class of 64 and former trustee of the college. Uh, search is a deeply human activity and it's also a deeply computational one. Navigation of spaces, be they immaterial or material, be they beneath our feet or beyond the stars, requires and inspires the use and invention of mathematical and computational tools for map making, sensing, and detection. Differential geometry, GPS, and even Google are just a few of the products of our desire to search. Search in the deep seas is particularly complicated. It's a dark, vast, and dangerous environment. It's also an extremely important domain for search, holding as it does hidden histories and cultural treasures. In this evening's lecture, we will explore the technical challenges and cultural and emotional rewards of maritime search enabled by advances in computational science. We are lucky to have with us an expert guide to do so. Jim, Gal Jim Delgado is a maritime archeologist, journalist, author, and documentary television host who has spent 44 years in work around the world on some of history's most important shipwrecks. These include ancient wrecks, Arctic ships of exploration, the lost ships of Pearl Harbor, and even most recently, the ongoing excavation of Clotilda, the last ship known to have brought slaves to America. Jim was a first-gen college student and earned his BA in history from San Francisco State, and later an MA in archeology span from East Carolina State, and a PhD from Simon Fraser University. Jim is currently the senior vice president of search the flagship cultural resources company in the United States and heads the company's exploration sector. Before coming to search, Jim held a range of prominent leadership roles in maritime archeology, span including positions as director of maritime heritage in the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries for the, Nas for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as well as being founding director of the Maritime Heritage Program of the National Park Service. Jim has served as host for the six seasons of National Geographic's The Sea Hunters and is a frequent guest on National Geographic series Drain the Oceans. Jim is also author and editor of more than 30 books and over 100 articles and reports ranging from the scholarly to the popular. His honors include being named a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, the Royal Canadian Geographic Society, and the Explorers Club. We're delighted that Jim could fit us into his busy schedule. So please join me in welcoming our, two th our 2022 Fall Donahoe Colloquium speaker, Dr. Jim Delgado. Thank you, Dan. The one thing I always like to start with, by the way, is that when you've worked for 44 years and you've been able to bounce around as much as I've been able to, it's not only a great learning opportunity, but it also gives you a good excuse for never being able to hold a single job for too long. 
That being said, now at this stage of the career, I think I'm exactly where I've always wanted to be, which is based on experience with academia, with not-for-profits, and with government, now to be able to take all of those experiences and to be able to work now in the private sector with the freedom and the ability that comes to boldly go where few, if any, have gone before, is the culmination of a life's dream. Because in this, um, and I think what you'll see as we go through in a couple of these projects, is the opportunity to forge partnerships that otherwise might not have happened. And in that, to essentially make a difference. In terms of making a difference, I think coming back to that very simple principle of computation and understanding through computation, it's important to take a look at one aspect that I'm going to come back to again and again, and that is the fact that while I grew up watching Star Trek original series with my dad, I ultimately came to understand that the final frontier is the oceans. It is so unknown to many of us and yet it is so important, and beyond the obvious facts of it being the source of most of our oxygen, that it's the source of most of our food, the fact that it has been the highway by which we have spread as a species, it is also a frontier that continues to surprise us and amaze us with not only its resilience in the face of ongoing threats to it, but also the fact that it remains the greatest unexplored museum and now we get to why I really like it as an archaeologist. Because as this great unexplored museum, it has much to tell us, not only in terms of the rediscovery of iconic, but also workaday craft that say so much, not only about our history, but who we are as human beings. And yet it is an unknown frontier. Now you would think if you pick up your National Geographic, your old Reader's Digest, and you look at that big map of the seafloor, that we know it. Well, we don't know it. Much of the Earth's mapping of the oceans has been by simply measuring the variations in its surface with radar to get a sense of whether well, there's a canyon here and there's a mountain range here. And so with that, you get those maps. And those maps go way back. But in terms of really understanding it, in terms of getting down there and mapping it, what we have done over time is slowly, periodically surveyed. At first, by dropping a line with a piece of lead on the end, to ultimately using new tools like sonar to get down there. But getting down there, particularly when you get to the vast depths of the deep ocean, a, a, a dark, unknown area, has been more challenging. When I started in my field, we knew 5% of the seabed. 5%. Now, given that this is 2 thirds of the planet, it's a pretty amazing confession of ignorance on the part of humanity, that we really didn't understand the surface of the seabed down below that water. We only knew the shallows. We really knew the, the, end of the, the, the edge of the pool. Today, thanks to more work, we are now at 20%, which I think is a good number. We're getting there. And that 5% to 20% has only happened in the last little while, because technology is speeding up, as well as the means being funded by an ongoing drive to learn more. Some of that is purely scientific. Most of it is economic. Some of it is strategic. But in this, where we're at now with that 20% is a new initiative that was announced a few years back that within 10 years, the Nippon Foundation and JEBCO would come up with this complete map of the seabed at basically the 100 meter level. Now, that's still a nice height. But given the way that sonar technology is advanced, that still gives us a fair amount of detail that we didn't previously have. In some ways, it's more like saying, OK, I'm going to really understand the skyline of Manhattan by not taking that photograph now from the opposite shore of Jersey with my cell phone, but actually moving along the waterfront and getting it close up and getting it and stitching all of that together. It's getting a better camera system. Now, it varies from nation to nation. And you have to excuse me, but I still have to use notes for some of this, because I want to get this right. At that 20%, um, in terms of understanding their own exclusive economic zones, a couple hundred miles out, the nations that have known that know more uh, are, let's start with 
the nation who knows the most, and that's Thailand. Thailand has mapped 98.5% of their EEZ. The country that's mapped the least, Japan, at 2.3%. China is mapped 88.6%. Canada, 64%. The United States, um, we're behind Iceland, which has gone 50%. We're at 30.1% in terms of mapping our EEZ. And the United Kingdom is at 9.4%. We're getting there. And these numbers are not there to say, hmm, but rather, hmm, because it's more better than it was even a decade ago. And we're picking it up at an increasingly rapid pace. Now, what that excites me the most about is that with this, it's more than just coming up with numbers and coming up with a sonar image. It's finding what's down there. Because every time we go, whether we go with a robotic vehicle or we go and descend in a submersible, we literally are in a final frontier exploring and finding new life as well as evidence of our own civilization. That's exciting. But from the perspective of somebody that's been in the field for a while, I have to point out that sometimes it's really exciting when we have a discovery like that most recently this year of a ship like Endurance. Endurance, of course, Shackleton's famous ship that caught in the ice, the iconic images of it trapped, being squeezed, and the test that that exerted, not only on Ernest Shackleton's leadership, but that of his crew who stood there and Frank Hurley photographing it, and then it being crushed and sunk and seemingly lost forever. When a discovery like this is made, it certainly hits the headlines, but what I think it also does is it reminds us again, not only of that museum, but of a find like this, speaking to the fact that down there are these things that not only compel attention, but hopefully compel some of the rest of us to get out there and find more. The other point I want to make, by the way, is that while all the attention has been focused on an iconic image like this, and it's rare, by the way, in my business, that you drop down there and the first thing you see is that the ship is telling you its name. It doesn't happen a lot. But what's also important is that because these missions do cost, what happens is that the science is interdisciplinary. It's more than just mapping. It's more than seeking. It is a wide range of oceanographic, chemical, biological research, as well as the archaeological, because these are moonshots in their own way, moonshots that are increasingly becoming more cost efficient, not only because the various scientific groups have learned to play well with each other, but also because the technology is advancing rapidly, but it's also getting less expensive to use. So for all of this, as well as the economic incentives of understanding where offshore oil and gas is or where deep sea mining might happen or a quest to find something like endurance, this is how the pace is picking up. For me, of all the projects I've worked on, one of the earliest ones was the iconic Civil Warship Monitor. Monitor, of course, built and launched at a time when all seemed to be in a really bad place with the Civil War. The South had won some of the early battles on land. The Confederates were known to be building an ironclad warship based on the burnt out bones of the steamer Merrimack. And when the Merrimack emerged as the CSS Virginia on that March day in 1862 to confront the Union fleet, all older sailing wooden ships and a couple steamers, it wrought havoc. It rammed and sank the Cumberland, pouring fire and death into her. It rammed and sank others, and the Congress was pushed ashore, that is, the warship not the folks back in Washington. And with this, everybody was afraid that all might be lost. They were urging President Lincoln to abandon Washington. But at that moment, a tiny little warship appeared that the Union Navy had fought against, but the president had said he saw that there was something in this. And so in 100 days, they had built this tiny little cheese box on a raft, as they called it, the low-hulled rotating turret monitor, which showed up and won the day by fighting the Virginia to a standstill. That's why to this day, when you tell somebody there's an ironclad guarantee, it's based on that ironclad. Now, Monitor was hailed as the ship that saved the Union. It became an icon. It became a symbol of American perseverance, of the roles that immigrants can play. Its inventor and developer, John Erickson, was from Sweden. It became a powerful piece of wartime, not only propaganda, but of a moment in which we began to reflect on that which would be the American character for us 
in an age in increasingly immigration had played such a powerful role and in the decades before had been seen as a, a bad thing, particularly with all of those Irish, not to mention those Swedes and everybody else. Now suddenly immigration, people coming from elsewhere were seen as something more popular and more powerful and a contribution to the fabric of American life. Monitor didn't last long. It sank on New Year's Eve in 1862, overcome by a storm, struggling mightily against the waves 16 miles off Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, as it was being towed to a new field of battle. The USS Rhode Island towing it finally lost the tow as Monitor began to fill with water. Its turret seams had opened. Water was pouring in. 32 men would go with Monitor. But Monitor was never forgotten. And as this iconic ship, various quests were mounted to try to find it. To give you a sense of just how difficult it was back then when these various surveys happened, when Monitor was finally located in 1973, it was found at unheard of depths at the time. It was 67 meters down. 220 feet, and well offshore. To find it, they towed early rudimentary sonar at 100 kilohertz, 200 kilohertz, um, not much, mowing the lawn, as we call it, back and forth, but also with uh, the vessel looking at and finally locating 22 targets that were more like blotches on the sonar record that were about the right size, but then you had to go and look at it. When they went back, and in April of 1973, what they finally found was based on going back through over 5,000 hours of towed video. And that was Gordon Watts, the archaeologist in charge, watching all of that video. Uh, it, this was looking through a number of photographs. But ultimately, finally, what they got to was they went out and with the Navy, they towed, um, and, and with other colleagues, they towed a system where they passed over the wreck and took 1,500 photographs. Navy intelligence then took those photographs, printed them out, looked at them, and literally used scissors and paste to come up with that mosaic, which proved to the world that, yes, this is monitor. Because as you can see, there it is, up, not upright, but on its, on its back, in the water, its turret displaced and off to one side. This was heralded as a great discovery, and it was, because here we were able to find something out there in this vast trackless sea. Bear in mind, too, the other part that's not really being talked about here is the fact that we weren't really into GPS yet. When I first started, we were taking bearings and lines of sight from land and saying, okay, there's the lighthouse there, and there's that over there, and okay, we're about here, and so there you go. And more often than not, you've been dragging a tiny little anchor behind you and think, okay, we're on it how much the world has changed. So you take that in 1973, and then you move forward a little better than a decade, 1985, and Robert Ballard, with money from the Navy, has been sent out to find a map, the, the previously more or less located, but to really finitely map the two submarines, Thresher and Scorpion. And in that, Bob's other mission to sort of go out and just take a look as a cover, is to try to find the Titanic. So it's a large area to, to look at. I mean, ultimately, and i got to go back again to the numbers because I want to get this right. Um, Bob's discovery meant that they were out there covering a 530 square kilometer area. The French came out and they did a lot of survey with sonar back and forth. And as it would later prove, by the way, they just passed off of it, but the sonar didn't pick it up. So when Bob went out, the systems that he was using to find Titanic were not only sonar, but also a towed array, a system. Argo and uh, Jason, where, where what you see here is he's got sonar, but he's also towing a camera. Again, these are visual systems that we're using to try to find these things. And back and forth they went until ultimately and finally they passed right over the wreck starting with debris that had fallen out as Titanic broke. Most famously, one of the earliest images was one of the boilers, till ultimately coming up to the main hull itself. With all of that data, they still had to sit down and go through thousands of images to come up with a hand-drawn map that really depicted what the Titanic wreck site looked like. These early images, I'm sure, you know, as Woods Hole released them in 1985, 
clearly, even just with that tiny little keyhole view, were Titanic. And I remember with all the rest of us that how amazing this was, that so far out in 12,437 feet of water, that we could not only find something like this, but go back to it, as Bob would do the following year, but also begin to get a sense of it. But still, the technology was such that there wasn't much we could do other than keyhole looks. Stepping back, I want to go to this point of sonar. Sonar, of course, had been developed earlier. We had used it as a, form, a system known as ASDIC to locate enemy submarines during World War II. We'd done a little bit of a technology trade back and forth with the British in World War II in the hunt, against, the hunt for U-boats in the Battle of the Atlantic. But sonar gradually began to be used more and more for finding other things. In 1948, a British salvage company, working with an Italian salvage company, began to use ASDIC to ping and find shipwrecks on the seabed. By the 1960s, Harold Doc Edgerton, father of strobe photography, um, had begun to work with side scan sonar. And he formed a company with others that today is EG&G. One of his graduate students was Martin Marty Klein. And Klein began to work on developing a mobile system, a towed array, side scan sonar, where you could take a sonar now and sort of as Doc had started with an earlier ping going down, make it go sideways. So that as that sound would travel out at 100 kilohertz, 200 kilohertz, and so on, it could pick up that which stuck above and give you an echo or a bounce back, and that would form an image. Now, those earlier images were grainy. But over time, they began to develop into something more. And if you had a more modern ship, then it really began to show up even greater and in more detail. And you could begin to sort to figure things out. Well, I think it might be this ship, or it might be that, or that's definitely a submarine. But th th these earlier images that Klein came up with, we got to the stage where we are today, now, where side scan sonar imagery is at a megapixel. I should, um, you know, it's a megahertz, it's a full megahertz, and those are the unclassified systems, where you can really begin to map with sound. So it's not just a tool for ultimately discovery, it begins to be a tool for characterization and understanding. And that was an important point. Side scan sonar, sonars in general, remain one of the basic tools that we use, and they've only gotten better. And each year, it seems that they get even better. So to now, ultimately, here's a, a project that Noah did just a few years back off of Stellwagen Bank. And with this, what you see is there's a wooden shipwreck that's barely sticking up above the seabed. But the resolution is so good now that not only can you see the outline of the vessel with the little lines on the sides, those are the ribs or the frames, you can also see an area where a, trag, a trawler has dragged itself across and dislodged a piece of the wreck. Uh, again, we're, we're learning more. It's, again, not just there's a grainy picture, we found a wreck. As we've continued to work with sound to map, some of the other developments that have come about have been different types of sonars and the use of sound in mapping extended into applications like Blueview, which is a, a trade name for a rotating sonar uh, with greater resolution. Blueview uh, was particularly put to use in maritime archaeological context on a couple of occasions early on. And the first one was this one, which is uh, in terms of open water. This is the USS Hatteras. The USS Hatteras is a gunboat served in the Civil War. Here it is engaged in the only naval fight between two warships in the Gulf of Mexico during the Civil War. And that's the Confederate raider CSS Alabama taking on and shooting down the more lightly armored and undergunned Hatteras off of Galveston on, July, excuse me, on January 11th, 1863. Two men died, and only two, on Hatteras, and then it sank. And it remains miles off the coast of Galveston in about 56 feet of water. The site was ultimately located and mapped, but visibility is often poor, and the drawings were very few. When the chance came to try and use the new systems, this was, and what we're seeing here is just a two-dimensional representation of what is three-dimensional data. We were able to deploy the blue view. And I, again, I want to go back to the numbers um, with apologies for doing this, but uh, my head for some of this is not the same, thanks to long COVID, with apologies. 
We mounted a Blue U 5000 tripod with its rotating head and with 35 dives made by the divers. We were able to gather this at 25 different deployments. And every time you see a little circle here, that's where that, that sensor was located. Those together, collectively, stitched together by James Glaser from the company, gave us these images. And this is just one of the many. But what you see here is part of the engine, the paddle wheel shafts with the connecting rod that made her go, and the remains of one of the paddle wheels. And here, for the first time, actually a bit of the stern of this iron vessel that was covered with armor in a vain attempt to turn an old steamboat into a warship. We also used it up in the Klondike. And with the Klondike rush, of course, lots of folks came to Alaska, but ultimately to go into the Yukon Territory to mine for gold, starting in 1897. In 1901, this steamer, the A.J. Goddard, the only iron-hulled steamer to actually go up there, uh, and interesting story, by the way, I just have to diverge for a second here from sonar and science. What I like about the A.J. Goddard is first it's named for its captain. Um, at least he was captain on paper, and that's Andrew J. Goddard. He was a merchant who decided he was going to make a living by taking a steamboat up there. Other people, they're coming up through the Chilkoot Pass, they're marching up with a ton of supplies on their packs with mules, ultimately a more tram system, steam powered thing to carry the supplies. But everybody's going up the side to get to Lake LaBarge where they wait for the breakup of the ice. And then they're building rafts, they're taking canoes, they're sailing as best they can in boats that they can build having cut down trees. Goddard takes this steamboat in pieces and hauls it up a piece at the time. They put it back together. They put a blacksmith forge up on the side. They heat the rivets. They put it all together, get it working. And then Goddard turns it over to the person who really knows how to run it, Clara, his wife, <coughs> who really is the captain of the Goddard. And they work for the next few years. A.J. Goddard sinks in 1901 when caught in a storm on Lake LaBarge. <coughs> it's overcome by waves. And it sinks to the bottom. And it remained undiscovered until uh, Local, that is in Whitehorse, would go up to this isolated shore and begin to search for it. And ultimately, with fish finding sonar, got a target that we were all able to dive on. <coughs> Excuse me. And so with that, um, there we are with Lake LaBarge, having sat down there in, you know, 50 feet of water, but in freezing cold water. To map it, we turn to Blue View. This is one of the many images, but with this, again, the systems were so good, and we've dialed the resolution down, but it's actually photorealistic in the original data. It's basically in different colors, as if you took a photo, but it's all measurable data. That's the key thing. And with this, in mapping the Goddard, this was a group of divers, again, who working you know, with us did, uh, with, thanks to the Ocean Gate Foundation and others, eight days, 130 dives using the sonar head and rotating it, including dives where they actually took it and lowered it inside the hold upside down to capture and measure, not just visualize, A.J. Goddard. Another project that I've been able to work on where we've also seen the changes is also in shallow water, and that is, of course, the iconic battleship USS Arizona. On that morning of December 7th, 1941, as the Japanese planes approached, Arizona was strafed, as were other ships. Torpedo bombers dropped their weapons. Other ships were hit and began to capsize. The California, the West Virginia, the Oklahoma. The USS Nevada took a hit, but remained afloat. Aerial bombs started to drop, and ultimately one 16-inch shell honed into an aerial bomb, struck Arizona near its number one turret, and detonated a black powder magazine that then in turn detonated the main magazine. And in a massive deflagration, like a huge Roman candle, Arizona went up, the bow nearly torn off, the fireball and the shockwave sweeping back, and in that moment, killing 1,177 men. It was that moment on the day of infamy that had everybody stop as this eruption 
climbed into the sky, and with that, then a rain for over a mile of pieces of Arizona and her crew. Arizona, at that moment, became much like the monitor, a symbol. It would be its burning superstructure that would form the basis of posters that said, never forget, remember December 7th, that date that would go down in history, said President Roosevelt in infamy. Arizona was only partly scrapped. They cut down the superstructure after the war. They salvaged a couple of the turrets, but then she was left, ultimately not to be raised to become a memorial that today many still come to visit. When the National Park Service, with whom I then worked, began to better seek to understand Arizona in 1983, the then Submerged Cultural Resources Unit went out to begin to map Arizona. And to do that, everything which took three years to do was done by hand. Now, this is a 608 by 97 foot long battleship that has been distorted by that explosion and those fires. Using a 100 kilohertz Klein sonar, they did an initial mapping. And then, in that shallow water, with a half a mile of number 18 nylon line, they laid a baseline across those decks with plastic clips indicating the spacing. And then with tape measures, as well as a handheld black and white grainy video camera, proceeded to spend a month each year mapping and drawing and comparing to come up with these views of Arizona, which for the very first time gave people a sense of what it looked like. And I remember when these were unveiled, uh, this is based on the 84 drawings. When we came up with the final versions of these in 85 and 86, they ultimately formed the basis of a model that today you can still see in the visitor center showing the sunken Arizona. And while it's shallow, the water is so murky at Pearl Harbor. <coughs> Whenever I was down there, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face at times, or you'd come up, and it would take, you'd be within three or four feet before you could actually finally see Arizona. So this was revolutionary. And in that, again, visualizing that which is not readily visible was a powerful moment. It was particularly powerful for the veterans and the survivors that the team was working with as well. And in that, we learned some pretty incredible things. What these maps, these drawings don't show is through that process, we got to really know Arizona well. Because as everybody would dive at the mapping team, I came along later as we were finishing up. You begin to see things. Overturned bowls from the breakfast in the galley area, forks. But the one that spoke powerfully to many of us was just forward at the, by the turrets. And there's exposed areas of wooden deck that are unburned and unbroken. And in one, in the silt, were a tangle of fire hoses with their, their nozzles still in place. And as those were mapped, what became very clear was that this is where a fire control crew was working. Arizona was already on fire from smaller blazes. Arizona had been hit. Arizona was already lurching and beginning to sink. And in that moment, <clears throat> this crew ran forward and with their fire hoses were seeking to put out fires and to save the ship and their fellow crew members. When the blast went off and struck near that turret and erupted, those guys ceased to exist like that. And the hoses dropped exactly where we found them. Nobody lived to tell that story. And we don't know exactly which crew they were, but we were there and hovered over this spot where you could see where this happened. And the mapping exercise made it very clear. Powerful story reflected in the physical record and unknown even within six feet of water until it was mapped. Moving forward, I mean, as we depicted this in a variety of ways, working with friends like artist Tom Freeman to give people a sense of it, the goal finally was to develop a new understanding as the technology evolved. So this is 2004. Pete Kelsey, member of our team at Search, but then with Autodesk, began to assemble a team not unlike the Avengers. But in this case, all of these companies, everybody stepped up Awesome, thank you. 
Everybody stepped up and did this pro bono. But with all of these systems integrating, LiDAR on the surface, multi-beam sonar, side-scan sonar, optical mapping, ultimately pulled together what you see here, which is an incredibly complex and very detailed mapping of Arizona. And it extended, ultimately, into Arizona itself with the blessing of the families and the crew who were still alive. Not all of that data is available, particularly in some of the more sensitive areas inside, but some of those images have been released, and in some of those you will see amazing survivals such as an officer's uniform still hanging in his locker, uh, desks that are still there. I remember sticking my head through a porthole once and seeing a phone there still and the desk in one space that had been an officer's cabin. We've seen far more, particularly as we've gone down through the years into Arizona and looked at it further. So with all of these folks, and there's a whole list that worked on it, the non one thing I do want to point out is, and it made the guys really happy that had done all the hand mapping, they were pretty darn close. They were off by a couple of inches here and there. The point is not that the systems were that much more accurate. It's the speed with which this was done. And ultimately, I mean, coming back to what happened with just stitching together photographs to make monitor um, visible, it's what, it's, it's what this, this stuff can now do. So that's actually all hard data, all numbered and all there based on the sonar and the merging of all of this, this data. Now, we're still doing this even in deeper water. This is a wreck that's in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's one that we're currently working on and reanalyzing for the Bureau of Ocean Energy and Management um, as, as part of a search initiative to revisit all of the wrecks in the Gulf that have been studied by archaeologists and to add more to it. This is multi-beam sonar which now is giving us a more three-dimensional sense, overlaid with a drawing of the wreck as this project was done in 2008. That was the state of the art as we began to do it. And again, now we're at, with this wreck at Alaska Knoll, we are at uh, a little better than 5,000 feet. So it's getting deeper. It's getting faster. But we needed to get it sharper. So about the same time this is happening, Bob Ballard, went back to Titanic with support from NOAA. And in 2004, on the ship Ron Brown, um, excuse me, 2005, 2004. In 2004, Bob went back on the Ron Brown and deployed his systems, Hercules, little Hercules Argo. And with these ROVs now, we began to optically, as well as sonar map Titanic. This was a difficult challenge, because here's Titanic, here's the stern, which had really not been visualized or studied much. The bow had been the focus. So now, all of a sudden, here we are doing this, thanks to Bob's incredible work. And in this, driving that ROV five to 10 meters above the wreck, um, this gave us the first downward views of a lot of Titanic that um, had not previously been seen, other than those early images fleeting as the camera system was towed more or less quickly past it and over it. Uh, the photographs that were taken, they were digital stills taken every eight seconds with these systems. And with that, uh, they mapped a 40 by 40 square meter area going back and forth with the ROV before repositioning, not just the ROV, but you have to move the entire ship. So with that, and in that way, they came up with a, a, a digital map of Titanic uh, that was 3,100 square meters in area with 756 images that were also captured, representing 400 gigabytes of data. Um, just an amazing amount of data to be gathered. But again, a demonstration that we were really beginning to get this stuff and get it better. These, they ultimately stitched everything together to give a down review of the entire bow, but here's where it's at with that type of imagery done by University of New Hampshire and the others. And what you see here, is, these are, we're a step ahead. We're better than we were in 1985. It's been 20 years, and the tech is really picking up. Here you see an area where part of the foremast has come down right by the winches, um, close up at the bow, at the break. That's an entrance into the cruise quarters. Um, having been down there both in a submersible and with robots, um, it looks a little different, of course, than in some of these grainy images. 
But considering the eternal darkness two and a half miles down, this was a game changer. In 2010, we went back. This time I was there as chief scientist for a portion of the mission with National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the National Park Service, the Wade Institute, Woods Hole, and RMS Titanic, the company that had the salvage rights to Titanic, but which had turned their attention to mapping and understanding everything and not to picking anything up. The systems we used were, new, were not new systems, but systems in some cases that have been formally classified. The Remora AUV that you, excuse me, the Remora ROV that you see here is basically a work class robotic vehicle used to get down and work. Mounting this with a variety of camera systems to make it the most expensive ROV on the planet was what Woods Hole's Advanced Imaging and Visualization Lab did under the directorship of Bill Lang, working with Evan Kovacs and others. And with that as well, we also deployed the, the Remus 6000s, and that's their depth rating in meters. And these systems were able, with all that you see there, to not only give us the sensors and also be GPS linked to transponders that had been rigged to give us a sense of where we were, but with still, still cameras and with sight scan sonar, we mowed that lawn, and we mowed it well. Again, coming back, we spent two weeks out there using these, and we did a six by nine kilometer area at, a, at various levels from 15 meters to 10 meters above the seabed or off of the wreck. We collected 130,000 images, as well as 160 hours of high resolution video and 37 terabytes of data, all told. And with that, uh, Bill and the team worked together with a classified system of data processing. Uh, and here, by the way, just again, these are the two systems. This is the there's the Remora and there's the Remus, uh, both in position. For those of you of a certain age who like television, the Wade Institute had named their two AUVs, Ginger and Marianne. <clears throat> this is the map we did of the overall Titanic site, and this is the smaller, more focused map. And what you see here is the bow of Titanic into the mud. What you see is a coloration difference in the seabed based on density, most likely from the strike of the heavy hull into the bottom. Uh, and the basic sediments down there. Then, with all of the other imagery, we stitched this together. I should say we. I say this is AIVL at Woods Hole. They did this. And so what you see here is the stern of Titanic with the visual data overlaid on the sonar. This is not a pretty picture. This is actually measurable data which really began to give us a sense not only of Titanic and its breakup and the forensic processes, but also to begin to understand that all science starts with measurement. So to do something like this, two and a half miles down, was seen as a pretty powerful game changer for all of us. You can see here, these are the four story high engines of Titanic that stick out from the stern, which went helicoptering down and slammed the seabed with great force. You can see a section of hull here with a condenser, you can see the boilers, including one that we think is the one that Bob first saw with their cameras going over it. And here, by the way, as well, which you can also see is where with the Russians in 2001, I was able to go in with them in the Mir-1 submersible all the way inside that engine room and back out. And only then when I came back did I tell my, my, my wife and my mom what I had done. <laughs> my mom famously said, uh, that she had not signed a permission slip for this field trip. <laughs> but um, again, two and a half miles down, and we're beginning to get this type of resolution. But where it really gets cool is not just the downward views, the bow and the stern together. And those are the actual colors without the lights fully on but also taking views, orthogonals, of the 250 orthogonal views that were taken, they included some that took hundreds of pictures and stitched them together. This is not an individual photo. It looks like an individual photograph. This is the bow section of Titanic where it broke apart. And so what you see here for the first time is a representation not only of the hull as it moves towards the bow, but where it broke, you can see the hull sides billowing out where it slammed. You can also see the boilers in place where the crew stayed till the end and where that deck has started to come down. And the detail is such that when we zoom in on these, you can actually count rivets. Likewise with the stern as well. 
Uh, this is the area. This is the last part to leave. This is where Jack told Rose to hold on. But seriously, this is where Baker Jofflin and others were at the end. It did say Titanic Liverpool for a long time. There's some who say they can still see the trace of some of the letters. But there are the propellers in place. They're a little higher than they should be because when this slammed stern first, the, props, the prop shafts bent. But again, images that we never thought we would capture and that we couldn't capture just given the visibility unless you come up close with the ROV and photograph it with these high level cameras. As well as artifact features such as this section remains of one of the grand staircase domes, most likely from the aft grand staircase of Titanic. But in this way, not only were we able to map and get great images of Titanic, we developed a detailed site map that went back to the 1985 site map and we began to be able to discern patterns of distribution from artifacts that represented pieces of the ship to that which had been in the ship, as well as those things that represented where people had come to the seabed. So that's where we ended up in 2010 with mapping and visualization. And that's more or less where we are today. <coughs> but that was a $5 million mission raised with private money with very, you know, just with the government participating and assisting, but um, not contributing any major dollars. So key to all of this is not only getting the technology to work better, it's not only to get it to work faster, it's also to find a way to make this happen more inexpensively. So these days what we're working with and working with a variety of partners, including people that are really smart like the people here at this university and in these programs, is coming up with systems and coming up with approaches that did it done faster. So coming back to an earlier project that I'd worked on where we went out to Bikini in 1990 and 1991 to dive on the ship sunk in the A-bomb tests of 1946, where we mapped the carrier Saratoga as big as Titanic, again by hand, over a series of dives in 180 feet of water with angry little sharks and only a little bit of residual radiation. Um, <clears throat> I, I gained particularly, you know, as an archaeologist, an interest in learning more about these and about the dawn of the nuclear age, but the ships. The target ship for the very first test on July 1, 1946, was the veteran battleship Nevada, which had survived its time at Pearl Harbor and gained a reputation as a ship that could not die. So, Nevada had been repaired and had fought in both the Pacific and the Atlantic theaters of war, shelled the Germans during D-Day, took a shell hit, got hit by a kamikaze in a glancing blow in the Pacific, was also hit by Japanese shore batteries, but kept going. So at the end, selected to be the arming point for the ABLE test of, Ju of July 1, 46. Painted international orange, that's the same color as the Golden Gate Bridge. It was moored in the center of a target array of over 100 ships that were spread out in concentric rings so that the nuclear blast would not be completely shielded by each ship, one after the other. The bomb missed by about a mile. It sank other vessels, it scorched Nevada, but remained afloat. And with that, everybody said, the ship that cannot die. The second test on July 25th saw another one of these 20 kiloton weapons, and in this case, the yield was about 23 kilotons, lift a huge water column up in that iconic image we all know from the bikini tests with that huge column that's roughly 300 meters. That stem is 300 meters across with a core that's about 20 meters in diameter with superheated gases, up lifting itself up to uh, ultimately, all told, a little better than 1,000, and then falling back down, leaving a, dropping literally a million tons of water and a million tons of sediment. Nevada lived again. Other ships were sunk. So <clears throat> Nevada ended its days in the aftermath of all this. And here you see the Japanese cruiser Sakawa sinking next to her. But there's Nevada um, with the Japanese battleship Nagato, which would sink with the second test still there. Nevada went back to Pearl Harbor, was left there to try to cool down. And in 1948, they took Nevada out 64 miles off of Pearl Harbor and sank. When COVID hit, all of us at Search were thinking, what? could we do in a remote mission, but what could we also do with our friends and partners at Ocean Infinity that could not only test systems in the age of COVID, but also perhaps 
be a moment where if we could find this ship, say something to the rest of the country about what we were all facing <clears throat> as COVID began. And you, we all remember very well in those early days and early months <clears throat> just where we were for many of us in terms of what does this mean, where will we go? And there was fear. So Ocean Infinity had, a, had its Pacific constructor coming into Pearl Harbor. They asked, we had a, an area defined, 100 square miles, with different positions given by the guys who sank her. And so with their autonomous underwater vehicles, and these are the, the Scandinavian versions, these are Hugans with uh, highly refined sonar, uh, high, so, high accuracy you know, stuff, <clears throat> but these guys had a fleet of them. And so with these Hugans, which are, are big vehicles, these things, uh, I could tell you numbers, but go twice the size of this desk. You launch them, off they go. What I've always liked about a or AUVs, by the way, is that they go down, they carry all the systems, all this instrumentation, but as the one-time father of teenagers, what I particularly like is when they come back up, if you're not there, they call you. They literally do, and then you can go get them out of the water. So with that, with the Hugans, um, with this high sas uh, 1032 dual receiver synthetic aperture sonar, which gave us a 1,000 meter swath at uh, a 25 knot speed, high resolution imagery, uh, down to five by five centimeters. That's how cool these things are. And down they went, and uh, with their multi-beam echo sounder, we got high resolution mapping um, from three operating feature, fig, um, frequencies, from 200 kilohertz for deep water to 300 kilohertz for near bottom inspection to 400 kilohertz for high resolution inspection, and all of those systems were dialed up. So with this and with the digital still image color processor um, and laser profilers and sub bottom profilers and uh, sensors, uh, down they went and uh, they could last for 72 hours down there, these systems. They've got that good a battery life, uh, much better than my cell phone. And with that, at three knots of speed, could run up to 52 hours. So the faster you go, there. so they went down and in 24 hours, they surveyed that 100 by square mile box, called us and said, got it. There we go, getting ready to launch. This is them driving it with the transponders. That is getting it down there and then it goes on its own. And Nevada from the main hull itself, overturned and damaged, to individual features. And what we were able to do is they then, they called when it was back up saying they already knew it was there. We joined and remotely ran the entire mission. This was a no contact, no touch mission, very much a COVID mission, where we were able to go through and say, this is this, this is that. Um, one sailor, by the way, had painted his name on the back end of a turret thinking nobody would ever notice when it was nuked. Uh, but with that, but we also developed this map. Now this is the low resolution map, but that map spread out to that entire area. And that battleship, you know, what we've got there is several, is 500 feet of it still left. All of those scattered pieces, we know exactly what they are and they're all tagged. And we were developed this, able to develop this site map in eight hours. So in terms of game changing, again, it's just getting faster, getting better, and there we go. And so with that, we were able to tell the world, not only had we found the ship that would not die, but that we've been able to do this in a COVID safe way, and as well to remind us that at Pearl Harbor and elsewhere, this ship came at a time when we were thinking that we were on the ropes. And we weren't on the ropes then, and nor necessarily were we with COVID. The systems that we use increasingly now, not only have that type of technological capacity with the sonar, but we're also using increasingly more visual methods to map. And with that, as the ROVs go down, we've now begun to task them with the actual mapping. And to that end, as we do this with telepresence, with crews calling in from around the world, I can run a mission either from ashore in my office or sitting right behind these guys at the science station, as here we are with Bob Ballard and his team, looking at the carrier independence, which was also involved in the A-bomb tests and which we found a few years back off the coast of California where it had been scuttled by the Navy. With these systems now and using telepresence, we're able to get the, AU, the ROVs to slowly, carefully map 
each of the wrecks. We still have the sonar data, which is integrated, but now with a wreck like this, and this we think, this is part of the ongoing study that SEARCH is doing for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management in the Gulf. This, we think, is a packet ship, the type of immigrant ship that brought the Irish and many others. It's in the Gulf of Mexico in about 5,000 feet of water off the mouth of the Mississippi. And with this, all of this data is there, and it's very high resolution, but it's also measurable because of the underlying sonar and the, and the, the, the measurements that come. And with that, we've also been able to take these ortho mosaics, thanks to the work of Scott Sorsett at BOEM, and also animate these, make them three-dimensional, and now today, on, in an online uh, virtual museum of underwater archaeology that BOEM has developed, and there is the, the tag, what we're able to do is not only give you a chance to navigate and look at it, but with the high-resolution data, what SEARCH is doing now is we're going back and rediving these things again and again and coming up with new interpretations and new understandings because now it's not just mission-dependent, We've been able to work on this over the past year and continue to find things. We just found the ship's bell, by the way, tucked in somewhere, and nice and safe and out of the way, but it probably has the name on it. So at some stage, I know exactly where to go back to see if we can figure out who it is. But here's the remains of the massive pumps that were used not only to draw water, but for an immigrant ship to fight fire. These are the remains of the hull down there at that depth with the rigging elements in place that could tell us that this was a three-masted full-rigged ship that had been built sometime between the 1830s and the 1840s. That's how nerdy archaeologists are when we come to ship types of things. We can actually start to date these things based on the hardware, as we can do with other aspects of archaeology. But also the really cool thing was coming up and finding that those are the draft marks. And what that means is that there's 12 and a half feet of that hull, the entire lower area, still buried in the sediment as a time capsule. That's the fun of consistently going back with the optical mapping as well as the others to re-study these and to look at them. And so even with a wreck that's seemingly stripped of nothing, this is a ship that was found in close to 10,000 feet of water. They were testing systems on the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer. The robot dropped down. My phone rang along with my colleague Dr. Michael Brennans and others, and they said, get on. We've got a wreck. We just stumbled on it. So we looked at it. The decision was made to map it. This map was done in the course of four hours. With that and with all the data, we then were able to start to zoom in. And over the last little while, what we've discovered is that that's the base of a big old donkey steam engine that shouldn't be on a ship. Or in this area, we've got the remains of the windlass, but a windlass from a much later period, whereas the hull seems older. And ultimately, what we've come up with, and I'm not going to announce it today, this is an eight in the name, but this is an 1870s ship that at the end of its life had been converted to a cut down barge and likely was towing coal or wood when it caught fire and burned. And if it is the wreck we believe it is, it represents an important aspect of history, not only because it's an older vessel, but because at this stage, older sailing ships were not only being used in this fashion, but they were the only means of employment to become an officer or even a working crew member for African Americans. And in this case, if this is the vessel we think it is, in 1903, caught in a storm, it was abandoned by its five-person crew and left to burn and ultimately went down. So with that, it comes back to why I love to do what I do as an archaeologist, because the science, the mapping, all of this ultimately leads me as an archaeologist, along with all my other colleagues, to say, what we're looking at here is this connection to people, to the past, to stories that need to be told. This wreck, found by sonar in 2009 and then passed over with a camera, we went back to and looked at. And most recently, having inspected this, we believe this to be, it's likely to be, a small little bark, or excuse me, brig named Industry, which is the only whaling ship known to have been lost in the Gulf of Mexico when it was sunk in June of 1836. And here's the ortho mosaic map of it all. And there's not much in here, but the outlines of the ship, one of the three anchors that we could see, and that large iron stove, as well as a number of bricks. A number of factors suggest that it is industry, but we don't have anything definitive. So it's a likely, maybe even a probable, maybe even a possible. But in that, coming back to it and looking at, we keep going back to the data and assessing it. And as we do, more facts emerge because we have it so nice and so well, including when you can really zoom in on the data and you see that there's a piece of the stern window from the captain's 
cabin at the transom that's still preserved and unbroken. And in that, again, coming back to it, if this is industry, it's a ship that not only was engaged in whaling in the Gulf, but a ship that had African-American crew members both as officers, part owners in a number of these cases, and also as crew members. And in the case of industry when it sank, and something that made national news, was the fact that as this was struggling and as that crew had to abandon it, and they all lived, the black crew members coming ashore in the Gulf in the southern state would have been subjected to the seamen's laws, which meant the captain had to lodge them in jail and pay for their room and board, and if he could not, they would be sold into slavery. Sailing alongside their white crew members and family friends, most of these folks grew up in and around Westport and New Bedford and other communities, but such was the nature of the country back then. And so a reminder through this one discovery that it's not just numbers, it's these human stories. And I'll close with this last one, which is a wreck that our friends at Woods Hole found by accident a few years back and when they were looking for a lost instrument that had been dropped in over 10,000 feet of water. They deployed sonar and had a snaking line, which they thought was the mooring, but turned out to be anchor chain. And when they dropped, they started to see things like a pile of bricks, a navigational instrument, and other things. So they called us, we looked at it, and we said, they were thinking it was Revolutionary War. We said, no, this is more mid-century, just maybe 1840s. But when the chance came to go back and map it again with the Okeanos Explorer, the NOAA ship, this Blake Ridge site, which is well about 100 miles out to sea, well out there and really deep, it's not where ships should be. We were trying to figure out what it was, what it meant. And ultimately, thanks to the mapping, going back and re-diving it again and again, given the high, high quality of the data and being able to map and measure everything, we've ultimately determined it's likely a two-masted brig potentially involved in either fishing or trade between either the New England states or potentially, say, a port like Charleston with Cuba, with Florida most likely, and others, because we found a, what's left of a well, a, a wet well that they would call it, where conch shells were in place, still stowed there, where if it wasn't cargo, the crew was eating them. But in all of that, coming back to why I do what I do. It's where we said with the Arizona. When we see these things, stories emerge. And you may not know the names, you may not know all the circumstances, but in just the same, the humanity comes across. Ultimately, in the science I do, I'm always seeking that ghost in the machine, as well as that which speaks not to literal ghosts, but to the figurative ones. This is a navigational instrument known as an octant. It's a very expensive piece of equipment, and it's lying there in that wreck, and it suggests, doesn't prove, but it suggests that these guys did not make it, because this is one of the first things you would grab. It was the equivalent of months of pay for an officer. It's one thing, but the other part that we come back to is this artifact that it took me a long time to sort out and figure out until finally I recognized what it was. It may look like a mass of corrosion, to you, but what it is is a section of copper and probably brass stained sediment and metal. And I don't know if you can pick it out, but those are buttons. Those are brass buttons or copper buttons. And there's needles. Sailors used to call these sailors wives. That's because these all male societies on the boats would go out there, and these guys were responsible for mending their own clothes, everything. And so a sailor's wife was basically his own sewing kit with extra buttons and the rest. And again, something that you might not leave. The fact that it sits next to a clay pipe and next to that a couple of other personal items, again, is a suggestion that nobody made it home. And in that, this might not be something as big a name as Titanic or Monitor or Arizona or Nevada or Endurance. What it is is a ship that speaks to the quintessential nature of who we are as people when you have a job that you have to go to. What this speaks to is the fact that so much of our history and so many of the wrecks that we've seen lost really reflect those that are the working boats, the fishing boats, the tugboats, those craft that every day are out there. To this day, we still lose more fishing boats than any other type of vessel. And more often than not, they never make the headlines. And yet they speak more to our common history than perhaps some of the others do. And that's not to knock the name shipwrecks. It's not to say that those are not important, because they certainly have compelled a number of the advances that we've seen. But with something like this, it comes back to why I, as an archaeologist, do what I do. 
And that is that ultimately I am seeking that human connection in the past. And in that human connection, they are us. Oftentimes, what you'll find in families are stories of those who went and never came back. What you find in some cases are paintings that were made of those who served and who, with their ship, just simply vanished. And perhaps that's what we see here with the Blake Ridge wreck. Most possibly it is just that kind of story. Whether we ever get to naming the wreck is somewhat immaterial. What's more important is that we look back at this aspect of our history and we use that introspection, we use that human connection from the universal to the very focused to continue to drive our quest for understanding based on exploration and science. It's 44 years in, I wish I had another 44, but the best part of something like this is, as this technology continues to evolve, is working with students and others earlier in their careers so that we can take this to the next steps. And if we can do this at the bottom of the ocean, just think what we can do when we get out there. Thank you. Jim, thank you. Um, so we're going to turn on these two mics here for people who want to ask a question. If you have a question, it would be helpful if you can make it there to come to a mic. Um, I can talk loud enough so everybody can hear. All right. Yeah, sure. Um, in the very beginning, you talked about you associate these percentiles with the various countries. I, I'm unclear what we're talking about. How much of the seabed is mapped to a high level of accuracy? Now, what's what is the seabed that you were defined as the global, the global seabed? And so, the national seabeds would be the exclusive economic zone up to 200 miles offshore. So in that, those are the areas that countries are responsible for managing and where we would control the fisheries, exploitation of oil and gas, a whole range of things. So a really big economic driver for most countries. And in particular now, people are looking more beyond oil and gas to, uh, to deep sea mining ports. Uh, it, it's become a more, more of a priority. My priority, of course, is understanding and exploration and the cool factor of what we find. But in that, what's been interesting is that just in the last decade, we've gone from understanding, and understanding means mapping it at a higher level of resolution, from 5% to 20%. But in that, a variety of countries have gone in these different areas and done it to a certain point. And as I said, in the US, we've mapped 30.1% of our needs. Oh, it's, it's our, I'm still confused. That's our territorial water? Those are our territorial, exclusive economic zone. Yeah. And those are our territorial water. So state boundaries go out three miles, uh, other than Texas and Florida, because they were formerly Spanish, they go out almost 10, based on the Spanish League. Uh, but the U.S. goes out 200 miles, as do other countries uh, under international law. So generally, each uh, it's just 200 miles out. Generally, are, are you comparing apples and oranges as far as how far out their economic zone is? No, everybody basically, unless you know, has a 200 mile EEC okay. around the world. When they overlap, it gets more interesting, like in the Mediterranean or other countries. Right. Thanks. You bet. Other questions? Anyone? Yeah. Early on, you mentioned the Thresher and Scorpion, the two U.S. Navy nuclear-powered submarines that went down in the 60s. Right. Do um, you have any gut reaction as to what we're not being told about what's down there now and how they how they went down, um, I think, caused the, the, yeah. the wrecks? I think, you know, what ultimately came out with both investigations pretty clearly, I mean, there's still a lot of people that doubt what happened with Scorpion, but having talked to folks and knowing, you know, some of the story, even, you know, there are as aspects that are classified, but I don't think that the classification really extends to what happened. Um, there's different theories as to what happened with Scorpion, from a hot run torpedo to its own torpedo hitting to the Russians doing it and all of that. Ultimately, um, in both cases, 
I think there, were, there was a, a failure in systems, potentially a, a, in one case. I mean, it looks with Thresher, for example, that a pipe perhaps had not been properly fully welded, that there was a leak and under pressure and with cold, it led to ultimately a scramble. The reactor failed and she dropped, for example, with Thresher. And that's the one I'm more familiar with. But as to what else we're not told, hard to say. I mean, there's a lot that's down there that has never really been encountered. There are stories from the Cold War that have yet to fully emerge. Um, we're getting more out of my area. I mean, I'm more a 19th century guy, actually. When it comes to all of that, and anybody that knows me and my, my, my own personal grasp of technology would understand that. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's really about all I, I really could say, because that's basically the full extent of my knowledge with both of those, other than having met folks who experienced that loss, as I have with a number of other sites. Yes? Um, <clears throat> so Dartmouth College, liberal arts institution. And um, I once wanted to be an archaeologist. So if I were 40 years younger, I would have totally attended this and be like, that's my career. I don't have that opportunity, but there may be people in this room that do. I am curious, how did you end up doing this? I never would have even known this was a possible career. I'm just curious, what did you study? How did you get into this field? I'm curious about your career story, early on in particular. I started in cultural resources management, walking in lines looking for flakes and firecracked rock in California. Um, the bug for the sea bit when I was a young Park Service person and they dug up a gold rush ship downtown next to the Transamerica Pyramid, 26 feet beneath the street with the bottom of the hull still there with leather bound books, pencils, remains of really grody sausage, uh, sausages packed with truffles from France, bottles of champagne which tasted horrible and uh, a few other things and the bug bit and with that the Park Service sent me off to the Presidio where thanks to Sergeant Bowen and the 6th Army I learned to dive. Um, and I just, I think it's been luck as well as perseverance. Um, and I think it's also been because I did not stay in one place. I jumped into different areas. I was always unafraid in some ways. Brash might, or rash might be another <laughs> explanation. But with that, um, and unafraid to work hard. I mean, for any and all of you younger folks, working hard, working those extra hours um, is the key, I think. It's not, it's not an eight hour, it's never been an eight hour job, but it's always been that drive to want to learn more and to do what it takes, reading extra, studying extra, working that hard. Um, ask my wife, ask my family, I mean, I will lose myself looking at video or these ortho mosaics or things of that sort, and then come out and say, you won't believe what I just found, because that's the other key to it. And that is that the 14-year-old who, who fell in love with archaeology, here I am. I'm still that 14-year-old. Jim, can I push you a tiny bit? Because you told me a pretty great story about what you were sitting by the fire. Yeah. Well, I grew up in the Silicon Valley before it was the Silicon Valley in San Jose, California. And they were beginning to develop what had been orchards and hay ranches. And I, I mean, I rode a horse before I ever learned to drive a car. Um, but they began to bulldoze it. And in that, they started hitting archaeological sites. And close to where we lived was a site that dated back some 3,000 years to the middle horizon in California prehistory, where the local Ohlone people, who had descendants in the area, had this large settlement and thousands of burials. And the construction workers just went in, and this was, I was 14 in 1972. And they just started ripping it up. And I was horrified. My parents, my teachers had introduced me to Egypt and Rome and Greece and the Maya, and I was fascinated. My parents refused to send me to Egypt at 13. I begged, I begged, but they wouldn't do it. And I said, I know we can't afford the whole family thing. I'll go. <laughs> but no. 
But my dad did take me every day because we had a museum downtown, the Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum in San Jose, where famously Dennis the Menace would one day visit in a comic book. I digress. But in that, all of a sudden, here was archaeology. So I assembled a kit. My mother bought me uh, a handbook for archaeology. So I assembled a kit uh, with brushes. Uh, I convinced our dentist to give me a couple of tools, uh, a few other things, a trowel, um, and off I went. And I rescued what I could. Mapping, drawing, photographing, collecting. Uh, the construction workers were very eager to get people's skulls. I saved everything else I could. Um, contacted San Jose State University and the archaeology program head, headed by Dr. Karen Bruns. They taught me more. But also, I was able to get in touch with the, the local community. And the Ohlone, under Chief Phil Galvin, were able to rebury those who I'd been able to save uh, from all of that. But that bug, that bit, was so powerful um, that it just it carried me forward. Um, yeah, some of my friends thought I was sort of a strange kid. I mean, because I was de regularly dealing with the dead. But it also was a good exercise in learning how to get things done and how to be adaptive. Ultimately, I was able to save more intact burials because I discovered that construction workers liked the nice cold one. And so I would go into my dad's beer fridge, and I'd come out with a six pack, and I'd start trading a single brew for a burial at 14. Don't try this at home, kids. But those were different times, and that's how I did it. So, yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm curious about the image pairings and the images with, with which you chose to introduce the different projects. I mean, on the one hand, they are, of course, illustrations, and they have a certain kind of you know, realism. And then we get to see the sonar imagery and the data, the visualization. So, and that led me to wondering, which role does the popular imagination play in your work? The popular imagination is absolutely powerful and important. I chose a number of paintings that were done by my good friend Tom Freeman, and who's now passed. But Tommy was an artist who did a lot of work with the Naval Institute and others. And we, together, in 1991, did a book called Pearl Harbor, New Images from the Day of Infamy, where working with historical accounts and some of the archaeology, Tom painted scenes from that day based on what we could best uh, interpret. This is long before CGI really got going and the rest. But in that, again, even if it wasn't completely accurate, I mean, how could we say for sure that the guy was exactly standing here or there? That wasn't the point. The point was to interpret it and to give people a sense of what might have been. And archaeology does that all the time, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Just go to Knossos, for example, and you'll get a sense of how far an archaeologist can go in the wrong way in interpreting ancient art or a site. But in this way, um, I think it's key. And that's why I continue to work in documentary television and the rest. Now, documentary television is a strange beast. And as we all know, with our trust or mistrust of media and documentaries and all the rest, sometimes, I mean, it's sort of like, what was it, Eloise in the children's book? When she was good, she was very good. But when she was bad, she was very bad. So, yes. So. To capture the popular imagination, you have to do this work. I think you, you absolutely do. It's not for everyone. Some of us will do it. Others won't. And that doesn't mean that every archaeologist has to embrace this or do this. But I think there's a few of us, if we can, that can and, 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 and likely should. Um, and what has evolved in my own career is I work now primarily with National Geographic, but with others. Search does a fair amount of this, actually. It's one of the reasons why I came to the company is that because we actively do engage in public interpretation and sharing. It's absolutely essential. We work for the public. Even if it's a CRM job and an agency is paying for something else, this is people's stories. So in that, um, say with the Drain the Ocean series, I'm the series senior consultant and have been since we started the series back, uh, well, really got it going in 2010 with Drain the, 2012, excuse me, with Drain the Titanic play an active role in saying, here's where we're at, this is what we're doing, introducing them to colleagues who are willing to talk and to share. Uh, you know, colleague Lauren Davis, University of Oregon, working now on offshore sites, for example, from the Ice Age, and looking at this question of earlier history now drowned due to sea level rise, and what that says about the population 
of the Americas coming in and challenging older models of, say, Clovis first and all of that. But in that way, introducing them to people who are willing to talk and to share, and then being there through an assiduous fact-checking process, but also making sure that there's no gonzo journalism. And in that, working with National Geographic, there, this is not a gotcha. This is not going to be uh, a mysteries of the unknown. We don't get into setups where it's like, so at the end, professor, was it aliens? <laughs> None of that. And trust can be built in those ways. I think that working in a whole variety of other formats is, is absolutely essential. And that's like, say, with the Bohm Virtual Museum as well, it's there. And that's also why, with all the telepresence missions, particularly the ones done by Noah and by Dr. Ballard, we're live. You can watch us in, in all of its glory of like the long descent of the ROV or the working on it. But it's also important, I think, for people to see what we do in a very transparent way. I'll come back to a moment where we were doing a small excavation and recovering a handful of artifacts from a wreck that dates probably to about 1818 um, in the Gulf of Mexico, 4,300 feet down. And the operator, very skilled, picked up one of those octants, those navigational instruments, and was carefully maneuvering it to put it into the recovery box. And at that moment, in front of the entire world, it nudged a little bit, and he broke one of the mirrors off. He said, well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen, all of you are watching out there tonight. Uh, this happens. And this happens all the time, because after all, with all of our systems and all our robotics, we're, we're people. We're only people. Meanwhile, the poor ROV operator is going, I'm going to kill myself. It's like, no. We recovered it, brought it back. We were able to deal with it in the laboratory and conserve it and put it all back together. But we openly and honestly discussed that. We always will. I mean, most recent, I mean, and I think that's key. Trust is built on honesty. And honesty, when it's plainly broadcast and out there, is, is the way we've done it. Now, with that, we do turn off the GPS so that nobody knows exactly where we are, because site location is absolutely critically important to not reveal. Um, you don't want people to know where to go in some of these cases. And that stands for land sites as well as underwater. But other than that, there it is. So, Again, this is not to advocate this for everybody. This is how we do it. This is how we, we do it at Search. This is how NOAA does it. This is how Bohm does it. This is how other colleagues do it. And it seems to be working, I think, for us. Whether it's a shallow water site like Clotilda, where we're working on this excavation of the last ship known to have brought people to America to enslave them, to a deep water site like Nevada. Or the fact that you know, we were also involved in Search as John Albertson was part of the team on the endurance mission. So. All right, I think let's let Jim take it.